Ah, there you are now. Welcome back to the workshop. So today's episode is more about the engine for the red GT race car. Uh, we're going to try and get this motor buttoned up today and ready to go into the car. Um, we have a few last jobs to do on the short motor and then it will be the uh, major parts of the long motor. So uh, on the last episode we got to the stage where we had this cylinder head on and sitting into place. Next is to get the rocker gear in. Now, I'm not gonna show you on this episode how to set up rocker geometry because I'm gonna do a video specifically on that at some stage um, because it's quite a complex, lengthy process. So I will just be putting on the rocker gear today, but as I said, I will do a video on it. Once we get this rocker gear on, um, I have already completely optimized this rocker gear for this engine uh, in the last couple of builds. So uh, the last, you know, you're aware of the fact that this engine came apart because it damaged a, a center main bearing strap. So the engine itself is actually perfect. It's completely uh, built the way it should be. Um, other than uh, it needs just uh, that uh, main bearing. Uh, being replaced which we've done so we're gonna uh, get this rocker geometry uh, sorry we're gonna get this rocker gear uh, set up and in place and then that will be the short motor built and then we'll move on to the long motor the first stage I always do on the head studs is to pull them to 40 Newton meters and um, I don't want to go straight to the full torque of 68 newton, meter, newton meters, which is what I put on the head studs with these ARP fasteners. Some people put 70 and, and 75 newton meters. It's not required. With these ARP head studs, the ARP lube and the nuts that these come with, there is no need to torque them to anything more than 65 or 68 newton meters. Um, 50 foot pounds. That's that's the one. Remembering back to the video, the last video, we'll put a link to it. Uh, up in the corner, or maybe it's there. Hmm, it's one or the other. Uh, always bring your torque wrench in one smooth movement up to torque. So if you don't get it, you have to stop and go again. The longer studs at the back stretch more, so they take a bigger amount of turn than the front ones do. And you torque a cylinder head radially out from the center studs. So you want to go in a big circle all the way out from the outside or from the inside to the outside. So you can see that there's much more movement on those back studs than there is going to be on the front ones. Watch the front one now. Comes up to torque much earlier. Less of a turn. Now, no harm on a cylinder head to go over them one more time just to check that they're still up to torque. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because the gasket has a squash in it. It specifically squashes under the torque of the bolts. As it squashes, it can let off torque. People ask me this question a lot. Do I re-torque cylinder heads after the engine goes through a few heat cycles? Yes is the answer, absolutely. But never more. Don't ever torque it to more than you did the first time. How would you re-torque a cylinder head after it had gone through a few heat cycles? You do it bolt by bolt by bolt. You must let the bolt off. So you have to actually loosen it and then you bring it back up to torque. You can't just go around it and check the torque. You know, just do this. Oh, it's been cold and you check the torque like that. No, you've got to let the nut off, let it off and then bring it back up to torque. And you do it nut by nut by nut. Never let them all off and bring them all back up again or you'll break the seal on your gasket. So you do it one by one, going in that circle that I told you, out from the outside. Which direction you go in the circle doesn't make any difference whatsoever. You start with the center. The way I do it is I go center, cylinder three, cylinder two, cylinder three, cylinder two, cylinder four, cylinder one, cylinder four, cylinder one. So I go out in a circle that way. You can do it the other way. You could go one, two, three, three, one, four, around the circle backwards, but I just like to go out and, and that was the way I've been doing it for years and years. So I go out in the circle from that. You'll see on my cylinder heads, I, I use these um, a metric kind of fastener here, um, which is a cap head bolt. 
I've changed to this because it just works really well for me. It's an M10 by 1.25, so it's a fine tread uh, metric bolt, and you can pull it to the same torque as the head studs. Uh, it gives no problems whatsoever, and I find it really helps hold the cylinder head down. Some people put an ARP stud into the, each end and use the uh, ARP nuts on them. I find it just don't have enough room for the gasket here for the uh, top of the rocker cover. So I just use those um, uh, cap head uh, high tensile steel bolts. They're, a, they're 10.9, so they're exact same as the ARPs, so they work fine. Last thing to do before we put the rocker cover on here is to set all of our valve clearances. Then we can put the rocker cover on and the short motor is done. We can get the gearbox on. When we're setting valve clearances, the way to do it is to bring the feeler blade in under the roller and then shift it sideways. What you're looking for is a nice light drag. Tighten the adjustment nut until it actually pinches it and you don't get that drag and then just back it off until you have that nice light drag across it. It should be enough to hold the feeler blade while you're nipping up the uh, locking nut. Don't go wild on the locking nut yet. Uh, we're gonna torque them before we're finished. Uh, mini engines, you can use the rule of nine. So the way the rule of nine works is whatever rocker is down, fully down, whatever number you have to add to that to get nine is the one you can adjust. So in this case, uh, one, two, three, four, five is down. So always start, one is always going to be the thermostat end of the engine. One, two, three, four, five is down. So add to uh, five, four, that gets you nine. Five and four is nine. That means we can adjust number four. One, two, three, four. Four is the one to adjust. Um, you'll also notice that there's another valve down here. Two is also down. Um, just be careful, it isn't fully down at that moment. You have to give it another little bit. Now it's fully down. So just be careful because if you adjust um, uh, seven uh, at that moment when five was fully down and two was just almost down, seven is still on the heel of the can. So if you adjust it there, when it comes down, it'll actually open up the clearance. So you need to turn it on another small bit just to get seven fully down and fully open. When you have all of them adjusted like we have now, it is a good idea to give them a final check with the torque wrench, uh, to give them just one final uh, check to make sure that they are up to torque. What torque should it be? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking on the bench here for my... Ah, there it is. Um, what torque should it be? I'd torque these to the same as the oil pump, 11 foot pounds. Oh, sorry, 11 newton meters. Um, that for me is the, the perfect torque for them. Move the torque wrench to the right direction. Um, you can go a little more on them. They can go to sort of 15 uh, newton meters or even 20 newton meters would be safe. Um, but um, you don't want to overstress these. They're only a little locking nut. Um, and you don't want to get them to the point where they are too tight uh, because it'll cause yourself problems. The last thing to do now with this cylinder head is to put on the uh, retaining uh, nuts here for the front of the rocker posts. Check the valve clearances one more time, then put the rocker cover on and get on with the long motor. Right, we're ready to put the gearbox on. We've made some preparations to the engine. We've put some gasket cement around the mate and flange on the gearbox, or sorry, on the engine block, and the same on this side. And then I put these copper shims in place. Yeah, copper shims instead of gaskets. I use these shims because obviously in a race application, we've increased the bolt size on the gearbox. When you tighten down with these stronger bolts to get a better join between the engine and the box, the old, original paper gaskets just get squashed out. You can go with just putting gasket cement and no paper gasket, but you have to be very careful. You can cause an abutment to happen between the primary gear and the idle gear. So what I actually have is these copper shims made up that I can use to set the thickness or to set the clearance between the primary gear and the idle gear. It's out of the scope of the video to show you that on this job, but I will do a video about setting that and using copper shims in the future. Gearbox I have also got set up. I have a gasket cement on both of the mating faces on the gearbox, and we're gonna just be able to put that straight down onto the engine. There's two dowels on the engine. 
that hold the gearbox and centralize it and put it in the right position. So now it's just a case of running the bolts down and then we can get on to putting on the uh, drop gear housing. What I'm doing here is I'm just taping up the edge of the primary gear and I do this just to protect it while I'm putting the drop gear housing on because we don't want that getting damaged. The, there's a feather edge seal that's going to drop down over this and I don't want the edges of the uh, primary gear where it sits into the clutch housing to damage the, the precious edge that's on this seal. So the way I do it is I just put a bit of that um, good quality insulating tape over it and then just work the housing down onto it. It's a good idea just to give that primary gear a little turn as you get that housing down into place because you want to make sure that the primary gear has engaged properly with the bearing that's in that housing. Then don't forget to take the tape off uh, because that'll be fun trying to get the clutch on <laughs> if you do. And then it's a ring of bolts in here and then we can put the uh, flywheel in then. That'll be the next thing to go in uh, after that. So these bolts go in, they get torqued. Uh, the bolts in the aluminium side are 28 newton meters and the bolts in the uh, cast iron side are 30. Um, so we spin them down, we torque them. And then that leaves us at a stage where we're very close now to having a full long motor built. Uh, do I use lock washers? Absolutely not. I never use lock washers on these bolts because lock washers have a handy knack of splitting under high vibrations of an engine and then you lose all the torque on the bolt uh, completely. So uh, in situations like this where you're using a really good quality fastener uh, into something like aluminium, aluminium is self-lubricating, there's no need to put oil or grease onto it, uh, just literally uh, pull the bolt to the right torque and you won't have bolts loosening off and failing. Split washers are generally where the failings come. Do I put oil on the bolts that are going to go into the primary side? Yes, because they're going into cast iron and cast iron doesn't have a, a, any kind of self. Well, actually cast iron is self lubricating when it comes to machining, but for bolts, it, it can bind up the torque, especially when you're using stainless steel fasteners like these ones are. Uh, so it can be just beneficial to use just a small bit of engine oil on them and that just gives them the chance to come up to their tightness or more accurately come up to torque. Really underneath the head of them is important. Getting a little oil just underneath the head of the bolt is important. Okay, I'll torque these down and then we can uh, put the clutch in. With all the bolts in the housing now tight, I've put my throw out washer. Don't forget to put this washer on. It's very important. This little plastic washer goes down over the primary gear housing and protects the seal. Otherwise, if you don't put that on, clutch dust is going to come from inside here, uh, which in the case of this is a metallic clutch dust because it's a um, metallic clutch plate. Go into the seal and it'll eat the seal and your seal won't last um, jiffy time. So it's worth having that seal in place or that seal protector in place. It's not to protect the seal from oil or the clutch from oil coming out. It's to protect the seal from ingress of dirt from the clutch side. This is going in as one unit. It was balanced to the crank as one unit. And when I take it apart, I do not take the clutch off of the flywheel unless I have to, because if I have to take it off, then the whole assembly has to go back to the balance and shop to be balanced. Uh, again, this clutch was working absolutely perfectly before, so there's no reason to uh, take it apart or do anything with it. Some people, as a matter of course, uh, take this apart to take it off the engine. There's no need to do that. Uh, you can get a socket. I've modified this socket by just turning it on the lathe so that it fits in there and I can tighten the bolt or loosen the bolt holding it on without needing to take the diaphragm off. If you look back to some of our clutch videos before, we have this clutch adjusted and working the same way as we did in the recent clutch video. I always use the OE original Moog bolt if I can have, have done. They're probably the best, most high quality bolt out there. A lot of the companies now manufacture a sort of a fancy version of this, but to be honest with you, I've been using these for years and the steel quality in these is some of the best around. I've literally never had one of these fail, ever, 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 in all the engines I've ever built. So 
I like to use them. They're the original bolt from the earlier cars. If you can get your hands on them, they are by far the best. The thing I do change, however, is the D washer. I don't know why they call it a D washer, but anyway, uh, the D washer is also a driving key. Okay, so it joins the flywheel to the crank with a keyway. There's a taper and there's a driving key. I always buy a really high quality version. These are my own ones. I make them myself. I get. Uh, EN40B round bar. I uh, machine off these rings, mill the flats into them myself and use them. There is ones made by some of the other uh, reputable companies that I believe are very good. I've just always uh, liked to make these myself because I hardened them in-house here and tempered them in-house uh, to get what is, in my belief, the best possible keyway you can get and it works really, really well. I've never had one of these fail since I started making them out of this EN40BT. Well, it's T when it's finished because it gets tempered. That's all that is. Um, so lining up our uh, clutch and flywheel so that uh, our slot, these are offset, so it can go in one of two ways. It can go in that way or it can go that way. So that actually doesn't go through the center. It's offset by five millimeters to one side. So it can only go in the one way. Um, you'll see that this is really tight in there and that is the way I want it to be. I machined them so that keyway lines everything up. A little tap with the copper hammer just brings it into uh, shape, brings it where it want and it's nice and tight. I find some of the other ones that are available, not all of them, I find some of the other ones that are available just a little loose in there and uh, it just doesn't inspire confidence. The last thing here to do is to put a bit of lubricant on this. People ask me, do I put Loctite on this bolt? Absolutely not. Good God, no. This is a bolt that should never get Loctite on it because the temperature that's going to come through from the crank will omit anything Loctite can do. What I put on this is the ARP assembly lubricant. Now, you could use a good quality, quality molybdenum disulfite grease, um, but uh, I just use the um, ARP loop because I just have loads of it from all the different uh, engines that I built. How tight do you tighten this? The answer to that is FT. You might wonder what FT is. Well, T stands for tight and you can figure out what the F stands for. <laughs> Alrighty guys, that leaves us pretty much at a good stage to move away or to end this video. Uh, in the next video, I'll have this engine dressed. So I'll have the alternator on it, the uh, oil pump housing, sorry, the, the oil filter housing uh, and the fan and the rad and everything like that. And we'll be ready to put it into the engine. I really hope you enjoyed following me along on this video as we got this engine together for the race car. The next video is the most fun part of any engine build. It's putting it in the car, it's getting oil and water into the engine and the radiator on and getting it started. Who doesn't love hearing a race engine fire into life for the first time? I only wish that this was smell-o-vision and you could get to smell the lovely burning petrol smell as well at the start of it when we fill it with race fuel. Other than that, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I'd really appreciate a like. It really helps the channel. Uh, anybody who is new, you're absolutely welcome. We're delighted to have you here with us in the garage. If you liked what you've seen today, have a look around at some of the other videos. And if you like what we're doing, please give us a subscribe. Again, it really helps the channel and helps boost it up. Other than that, guys, there's nothing more for me to say other than comment in the comment section down below. Yeah, what did you think I was gonna say there? And I'll see you guys on the next one.